All right, so since we're uh, spending four weeks on wireframes and prototypes, I do want to start at the very beginning. Um, if you happen to have had one of my other UX courses, um, you have likely been sort of presented with these ideas. I assure you this is going to be a really short uh, uh, blurb, so you might just watch it anyway. But um, we have to start with the beginning. What the heck are wireframes and prototypes? Let's sort of define and look at what those uh, basic elements even are. A wireframe um, is, we think of it as a schematic or blueprint, and fundamentally it represents the overarching overall structure of our site, right? Like this is a static element. Um, it's very much like a blueprint for a house, right? It's not defining the colors or um, the type of carpet or anything like that. It's simply defining the physical structure, which allows you to visualize how things are going to be uh, interacted with, right? Like the, the flow of the application and that sort of thing. Much like a house, like you do a blueprint, not only so you have a plan to build from, but so that you can see what you're doing, right? Like you get a feel for how things are going to connect together and so on. Uh, wireframes are in fact non-functional, means they're static, right? That's what makes them a wireframe. They're just sort of uh, non-interactive things. Uh, they do tend to start real low fidelity and we gravitate towards higher fidelity. So we start with very quick to produce, low fidelity, very rough uh, wireframes. And we gravitate towards much more high fidelity ones that do take longer, but that are eventually packed with more rich uh, details based on our experience with doing the earlier versions. So we gravitate from loose, uh, low fidelity to uh, tighter, high fidelity ones. And as I said, that's kind of redundant in it. Blueprints for designing the actual interface. So when we actually go to the design mode, they will serve as a foundation and a blueprint. We're not going to be changing these things radically later. There might be some tweaks based on the design we use that we have to make, but it's not going to be uh, radical, huge changes because we've kind of made those structural changes early on. So here's a nice example. Um, and it's uh, hand-drawn, of course. And you can easily tell kind of what the various things are, and it's pretty nice little wireframe, right? Like it's not uh, super high fidelity, but um, I would say this is a pretty high fidelity um, wireframe in general. I guess you can get much more precise even, but you know, there's real text. It's it's pretty clear what's uh, what's what, and uh, we can interpret this very easily. Low fidelity wireframes tend to be extremely rough, and at times uh, only the person who draw it. New, knows what it kind of in, it, it, it's doing or what the different pieces are. So you tend to gravitate towards this type of wireframe where more people can understand it, but you use lower fidelity ones to crank them out and to explore ideas real quickly. So here's a similar one, uh, except this one was done on a computer. Looks like it was done with a tool called Balsamic, which is pretty popular. Um, so yeah, it's uh, it's pretty much the same thing, right? Like it's got real content at times. Sometimes it's fake, sometimes it's real. Um, but it's a pretty easily interpreted document to show the structure. You can apply many different styles and designs on top of this. So a few quick notes about wireframes just uh, to clarify some things. First off, um, notice how the parts of the interface are very easily identifiable. We know what the tabs are, we know there's a movie, we know there's lists of content. Um, in fact, in this one right here, the parts are extremely identifiable. We know where the navigation, the search, the social media, the logos, all this stuff we can easily understand. We know what it is, like it's interpretable. So if your wireframe is so rough that you, people can't tell what anything is, then it, it sort of loses some of its value. So some of your early wireframes are most likely going to be very vague, and that's fine for you to explore those things. So you can crank them out. You know, if you want to sketch out a wireframe in like 30 seconds just to see if a bis basic structure kind of has the potential to work, I think that's fantastic. But we want to gravitate towards wireframes that we can um, kind of collaborate on and look at and talk about, right? One of my favorite things to do is just like this person did is have a um, use a black pen or marker and wireframe and then use a red one to add notes and it's a fantastic way to indicate sort of interactivity or to um, if you're doing a super rough diagram sometimes you just need the red just to quickly note what things are like oh this is a block of news elements this is the navigation and so on that way when you if you look at it later it will still mean something because even you might forget if it's that rough so the secondary notes I think are tremendously helpful. Also notice they've used actual text whenever possible. It's so tempting just to plop lines in, but at least for headings, navigation, and that sort of thing, 
um, you should be able to plug in some actual text, right? Do that as much as possible because the size will impact how you design, right? I mean, if it's a really tiny uh, space and you've got a long text to fit in, and you're going to realize, oh, wow, that's too small. But if you just throw in a few lines, uh, just scribbles, you know, you might not even realize that. The other thing is you should have planned your site a little bit by now, right? You should have a site map or a flow chart, something to document sort of the structure that you're going to be doing so uh, for example your navigation you can see there's seven tabs here and uh, they should know what those seven tabs are going to be so that they can then wireframe them and sketch them in all right so that brings us to prototypes um, and at their heart they just they're there to create the illusion of functionality right a prototype we do a prototype because it's faster and cheaper to do a prototype than the real thing right so you think about like the automotive world they use prototypes right they, they prototype cars into concept cars they spend millions of dollars on these things um, and that sounds awfully expensive and it's incredibly time consuming but it's much cheaper than designing a car tooling up a whole factory and start cranking them out to only then find out people don't like it or it doesn't work the way you expected it to so um, it is much cheaper to do a prototype of a car than it is to do the real thing and at times on the web, we kind of sometimes we want to curtail this and we think, oh, I can just build it faster and see if it works. But the reality is you can do a prototype way, way faster. And it just is there to create the illusion of functionality so we can explore something and see how it works. Um, typically, we're going to simulate a small set of features. We're not necessarily trying to create like 100% of every last little detail in the entire thing, right? Usually there's certain parts that we're trying to understand. Uh, maybe your site has a user membership section. And at first, you're not really worried about that. You're worried about the main functionality of your application. So you don't necessarily have to prototype the user profile section or something, right? At least not at first, because that's not the heart of your problem. So uh, your, your prototype can be limited um, and typically should be. It should be focused on just what you're testing out and working on. Uh, one of the great things compared to wireframes is that it lets you get a real good feel for how things are flowing from screen to screen, which can be uh, quite useful. Uh, typically, they start off as simply interactive wireframes, right? Like we can just take our wireframes and make them interactive. So the navigation points basically to other wireframes and the elements in the page point to other wireframes. And it's the easiest way to start off is just take wireframes and link them together such that you can click through them to simulate how things are going to flow. Naturally, they start off sort of low fidelity like wireframes, and they can gravitate towards higher fidelity, more detail, um, and even richer designs. Some people will even go so far as to prototype their final designs uh, before they actually start developing it. Um, and a great thing to keep in mind, which we're going to cover in much more detail, is that uh, prototypes do, in fact, have many potential users or uses and audiences. Um, we might not really realize this at first. We think, oh, we're just going to make a prototype and see how it works. But is that prototype intended for um, the client? Is it for you, the designer, just to explore the idea to discover the best solution? Is it for your internal team's communications? Is it, um, is it a prototype to help sell the product, to get venture capital, perhaps? Um, so you have to think about who the who the prototype is for. And once we realize that and we start thinking about that, it really modifies how we do things. So one important consideration um, to think about as we approach this course is I want you to really think about your workflow and what you want your workflow to be like. So as we do paper wireframes, those wireframes can naturally lead to digital versions, right? Those digital wireframes can become prototypes. Um, and later down the road, our wireframes can become a foundation for, or should become a foundation for, our actual design, like our visual style that we put on top of it. Um, and then to confound things even more, prototypes can become uh, motivation and impact our wireframing. So uh, a lot of people, well, we'll get into that in a second. Uh, the point is that this is all; these are all sort of interwoven. We've got these paper wireframes, digital ones, prototypes, and our final designs, and how all these things sort of flow together. And so, um, there's a lot of tools on the market, and I'll be kind of. I may not address this specific issue, but um, when I discuss various problems I have maybe with certain software solutions, this will become a little more clear why uh, I feel this way. But just keep in mind, these are sort of interwoven elements, and it, it makes sense to think through the strategy of how you uh, weave them together and how you use them. 
Um, and it's kind of for this purpose that some people have actually abandoned the idea of a wireframe and they just do prototypes. So even though at first they might start drawing, sketching like static ideas and it's a wireframe at its heart, they are so quick, they quickly get to prototyping because the prototyping impacts the wireframe so dramatically, not to mention that the prototypes are essentially interactive wireframes. So they're doing them sort of intertwined together. And I think it's important to think about, um, you know, you don't go to one mode and do wireframes and then, okay, now let's move on to the prototyping stage and we can carry everything forward into our prototype and then we'll move on to the design stage because you need wireframes as blueprints for your design, but you use the prototype to explore and test them. So finding a solution that weaves all these together is really important. Um, I'm going to talk about my solution to this and the approach I take, which obviously is tailored to me, but there are many, many different options you can do. So I encourage you to explore the various options. Um, I tend to take an approach that is geared towards being generic, meaning we could apply it to mobile application design, websites, um, website uh, or web-based applications, kiosks in a um, museum, or any other interactive digital interface you could ever imagine uh, could be prototyped and wireframed in the systems that I sort of use and outline. That said, there are many sort of niche and nuanced ones geared towards maybe like in particular the mobile app development for like the iPhone. There's some really specific tools to just doing that. So if that's the world you live in, then by all means, feel free to embrace those tools because they're probably going to increase your productivity. Um, but on the other hand, if you do a lot of different types of work, I suggest a more generic approach like I'm going to take. And if you just want to start your foundation of skills before you deep dive into one of those, I also suggest sort of a broader view because that way uh, someday you can change roles a little more easy and it's not going to feel so, so like alienating in a way. Fundamentally, we use these things because they will make our design stage far more efficient and um, we're going to talk a little bit about this more like the benefits of doing this, but what I have found with uh, with students as I take them through this process, um, by the time we go through wireframing and prototyping and all that, and we get to Photoshop and we're finally designing the interface, um, they're amazed at how little um, refinement we need. Yes, they have to refine the styles and the visual aesthetic that they put on top of this, but they're not refining like What's the navigation going to be? How do these elements work? How does it all fit together? What's it going to, like, what's the basic structure going to be like? No, they're making visual stylistic decisions, which it's really nice to isolate those. So if you find yourself opening up Photoshop um, to design a website and you're like, okay, I wonder what the navigation will be. And then you have to go figure out what the navigation will be. Well, you've like completely missed the boat, right? Like in my mind, you've got a broken process. You first have to go plan your project. You have to then... Um, do your wireframes and prototypes, and then finally you get to go design. And it sounds like a longer process, but in the end, it is much more efficient. So here's my sort of rant on this, and I actually wrote this out. I'm not a big fan of long slides, but the time to sort out the navigation, the flow of your application, the purpose of your site, the content that will be in any page, the foundational structure, and all that stuff is not in Photoshop as you design the interface. And that's sort of the theme or the idea behind this course, is that all of those decisions should be made prior to getting to Photoshop. So once you get land in Photoshop, you actually find that you're much more hyper efficient, right? Like you're actually designing a better solution based on solid plans and uh, it's actually way more efficient, okay? So that's our um, sort of introduction, I guess, to uh, wireframes and prototypes.